good evening everybody good evening uh, this is see this is cjo podo the secretary of trishul management association let me take uh, opportunity for introducing all the prestigious members of tma and the nri taxation and internet in investment management dubai for joining this joint meeting between tma and yourself sir i would like to thanks cl sony our president who took the great initiative in coordinating this meeting and I, of course i would like to thank ca ajish and dr tarbajan for coordinating this particular program it is one of our many webinars which is happening now with the effort of sony we were able to do continuous yeah. uh, meet, meetings so it is an opportunity to interact during the covid time now uh, now if i'm going to talk about tma the people who don't know about tma tma is a affiliated organization of indian management association or all ima of new delhi it's an allied organization with members members with both business and professional managers like chartered accountant engineers and all the uh, other professional members in tma at present we have 405 life members and 18 institutional members and apart from this we all the privileged prestigious business houses of thrissur are members of tma so this is a small introduction which i would like to share with you as we are running late i would like to get on to the programs over to you sony i think you can start off. thank you yeah Uh, before start uh, let us re- uh, let me request uh, ca ajax from dubai to introduce our uh, faculties ajax please good evening ladies and gentlemen okay close just can you hear me yes uh, thank you everyone for joining this evening session it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our respected speakers of this event before that let me tell you in which context the plan for this seminar arise we have a group of 500 plus chartered accountants in dubai with many prominent members like ca james matthew ca raju menon ca mahmud bangara who are past chairman of icai dubai chapter and ca darmajan pateri past treasurer of icai dubai chapter along with many senior chartered accountants in practice and industry just two weeks back we had a scintillating discussion on nri tax session especially tax planning for retaining nri and their future investment options in india some of us may get an opportunity to settle in india soon so the question of tax planning and investment become very relevant and very crucial and we are short of time <coughs> we decided to bring expert speakers to our forum and i contacted my friend ca sony cl president of tma within a short time ca sony arranged a high, very high profile and banking expert for this event thank you all team team men let me introduce our speakers our chief guest ca g ramaswamy is past president of institute of chartered accountants of india during 2011 to 12 and managing partner of g ramaswamy and company chartered accountants who are pioneers in taxation and company laws since 1984 He was past board member of International Federation of Accountants USA. He is a fellow member of ICAI and ICSI, honorary member of Association of International Accountants of UK, and Institute of Chartered Accountants of Australia. He is currently the chairman of Indian Institute of Insolvency of Professionals of ICAI. He is a most sought after speaker on national and international conferences, and he is passionate about sharing his knowledge and expertise. our second speaker ctp oswal is managing partner of tp oswal and associates mumbai being an expert in transfer pricing he was holding various positions in many sub committees of united nations he is a rank holder of a final exams in 1977 tp was a professor at university of mumbai and is a visiting professor on international tax session at vienna university austria he is a regular speaker on international taxation and company law 
TP ranked as 11th in the top 50 tax professionals in the world by Tax Business Magazine of UK in 2006. TP Spem is rated as one of the world's leading tax firms during the years from 2009 to 2017. Our third speaker, Mr. Somashegar, is an expert in the field of FEMA and banking regulations. He is based in Bangalore. He is a professional banker with 40 years of experience with leading public and private sector banks. He is former vice president and head resource manager at Axis Bank. His core competencies include FEMA regulations connected to NRI business, international treasury management, forex, and trade finance. He is a faculty at premier institutes like KJ Somai Institute of Management, ICFA Business School, FEDI, and many other reputed institutes. He is also a regular faculty at Indian Audit Standards Board of ICAI for foreign exchange business, trade finance, and NRI matters. Mr. Somshagar is a postgraduate in international finance from Karnataka University and a certified associate of Indian Institute of Banking. Thank you all. Enjoy the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ajax Joni, for the brief and crisp introduction of our respected speakers. Today, we are all here for a reason, to get the best knowledge out of the best in the country. And this made happen because of the one man. I'm glad to introduce our chief host. Before that, three rules. Please mute your microphone. Second, before you leave, do not forget to fill the feedback form link I shared in the chat box. And third rule, do not forget the first two rules. Our chief host, CA Seal Sony, is the president of Trishur Management Association. He was a former chairman of Trishur branch of SIRC of ICI during 2011 and 12, and he led the branch to win the best commendable performance award in the national level from ICI. The branch also got the best award in the Southern region. During his time, this branch acquired new premises, which is the second largest infrastructure for a branch in India. And coincidentally, our chief guest, CA Ramaswamy, was Honorable President of ICI. He also served as a chairman of Sikasa branch and won the best branch award in the southern region. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who made this webinar happen possible with his team. Please join me to welcome CA Sony CL, President TMA. Sir, the screen is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Dharmajan. Am I audible, Dharmajan? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good evening and a warm welcome all of you to TMA webinar on NRI taxation and investment management. A respected chief guest, CAG Ramsawmi, our eminent speaker, CATP Oswald. Our speaker, beloved speaker, Mr. Somase Karan B, former Vice President and Head Research Axis Bank, Office Bearers of TMA, Dr. VM Xavier, Senior Vice President, Vinod Panjala, Vice President, our Dynamic Secretary, Sijo Pono, Sijo Pono, Tresha Manoj, Joint Secretary Prada Borki, and past presidents of TMA, CA B. V. Gobal, CA T. S. Anandaraman, Gunavardhan, and almost all past presidents are present here, Anand Menon, and so on. It is my proud privilege and great honor to welcome all of you to this webinar on NRA taxation and investment management. As mentioned earlier, a few weeks back, Myself and uh, Ajax discuss about this topic and uh, immediately I contacted our past president of ICAC, G. Ramasamy, for this program. He helped me to making this event possible, getting the faculties and all arrangements. 
today we are listening to eminent and legendary speakers cag ramasamy on ori of nri taxation and investment management then eminent tax expert from mumbai ca pp oswal sir popularly known as tp not transfer pricing pp oswal also very eminent tax lawyer and uh, a leading pros also in the taxation subject and of course somak sreger sir for uh, banking and related topic on fema at the outset i thank all my team members for give me this immense support for making this program in a significant manner most famous nri who is famous all over the world you know service rendered by nris to the country earlier fee we see their services only now we are seeing their sacrifice also once upon a time kerala was known as money order economy today it continues but it in a electronic form per capita income of kerala is very high in india it enjoys best standard in living you can give all the credits to non resident indians and in our case you may be knowing ma yusuf ali gulfar muhammad ali pnc menon and many more they started with a humble beginning now they called an empire but most important is that they shared their wealth with others the condition in the gulf are very unfavorable not only today due to covid but also it is a natural condition of the gulf such as deserts and extreme heat conditions vincent churchill was told they have shed their blood and sweat and tears for the country now we came today for this webinar i am sure this will be useful to all of us because all of our main speakers are very eminent and veteran chartered accountants they have immense experience especially in the area of non resident taxation and fema related issues so whatever they are going to say today is gospel for all of us ca g ramasamy is very close to many of members and he is almost a trishurian and many times he is coming here last for the budget analysis also he joined with the tma for the program he is the past president of ica and also instrumental in bringing the best infrastructure to trishur and also during his period many of the branches in ica like kondotur ernakulam alappi and so on ahmadnagar extra got excellent premises during his term on behalf of trishur management association and nih nri charter council from middle east i welcome you sir to, to this webinar welcome ji rama sami sir to this program now catp oswal the top tax expert in the country who agreed to address today on behalf of tma and all the participants here i cordially welcome you to this webinar i also welcome mr somrajan vice former vice president of axis bank to this meeting also welcome all office bearers of tma managing committee members members of tma invited guests to this program last but not least the nri charter accounts and businessmen non necessary kerala are attending this program all are eagerly waiting to hear our 
layered speakers. And the co host from Dubai, CA Ajax and CA Darbaja Patteri, I welcome both of them to this meeting. I'm not standing the way these three eminent speakers and the learned audience. Let me conclude by welcoming our honorable guest and all our members and participants to this webinar. The most famous NRI I mentioned in the beginning is none other than our father of nation, Mahatma Gandhi, because he started his career as a lawyer in South Africa, then returned to India for fighting for our freedom. With this, I welcome all of you once again to this webinar. I wish all of you very a fruitful session ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I request C.A. G. Ramasamy, sir, for the overview of the session, overview of NRA taxation and investment management. As introduced earlier, he was a past president of ICA and Many of the charter accounts from Middle East attending this program during this session, they requested kindly touch upon some of the professional opportunities of NRI members, even when they retain. Because, because of this situation, many of the NRI charter accounts are planning to return back to India. Over to you, sir, CAG Ramos. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. Soni, Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Mr. Soni, the president of PMA after Chur, Mr. Seju, secretary, and the Mr. Ajax, CA Ajax from Dubai, NRI Chartered Accounts Association, my great friend and the reservoir of the knowledge in the international taxation. CATP Ostwal, Mr. Somshegar, a person is a vast experience in the field of banking and investment. My respected friends, chartered accountants, participating in this webinar organized by the TMA jointly with the NRA chartered accountants. Good evening to all of you. At the outset, I must thank the President of TMA, Mr. Soni, who has given me this opportunity to join this webinar and interacting with all of you in a fruitful and purposeful manner. Friends, two important points which I have to share with all of you. One is relating to a non-resident, resident, taxation of non-resident, tax planning, as well as the professional opportunities for chartered accountants who are all coming back to India, sitting there, going to set up their practices. We have wonderful tax expert on international taxation, Mr. T.P. Westwall is going to take all the issues related to the NRI taxation, especially with reference to the Finance Act 2020. Friends, we have seen that in the last few years, the continuous changes, amendments are taking place in the Income Tax Act. Especially with reference to the international taxation, number of amendments have come to identify the areas of tax collection for the government. In fact, from the beginning of the, this government, the first term itself, previous term itself, a lot of issues have started relating to the bringing back the amount slashed outside India to outside India as to be taken back to India into the economy. The number of initiatives the government has taken under the supervision of the Supreme Court, they have presented on many issues. Later on, the government had started about the insolvency and bankruptcy code in 2016 to identify the areas of banking sector, the defaulters, the chronic failures of the repayment of loans to the banks, 
Similarly, that have started working, and the government has introduced the one tax for the nation, one nation and one tax, merged the many taxes into single tax. They have introduced the goods and service tax, which is implemented with effect from first July 2017 onwards. Prior to that, the government has brought out a very very important surprise to the nation by demonetization and then they have given an opportunity to people to bring back their money from foreign countries disclose it pay the tax and to get away from all the difficulties of foreign assets and foreign income and the number of changes they have taken in the case of a filing of an income tax return the disclosure relating to the foreign assets by the indian char indian residents those who are having an income outside india those who are keeping the assets outside india then there is an amendment relating to their come out with a separate act block money transaction act binami property transaction act so many amendments and the plethora of the agencies has been constituted and the prevention of money laundering many agencies have started working in india there was a great heat on the industrialist and many of the politicians have faced a great heat on this the regulatory measures the amendments along with the changes in the companies act the companies act was notified companies act 2013 implemented the number of changes have brought into the companies act so that there will be a proper disclosure of the financial informations to the stakeholders and very recently i was also the member of that committee constituted by the government which was also as discussed in the during the last budget session related to decriminalization of the companies act many provisions under the companies act have been completely decriminalized there is no criminal proceeding against the failure non compliances but however the hefty fine and penalty have started living on this non compliance the opening up of an economy by way of inviting foreign direct investments opening up of an economy by way of an inviting the foreigners to start up their own industries in india the government has started working towards bringing the economy back in a proper position the previous budget presentation the finance minister very categorically mentioned in the parliament the fight to lean economy is the our objective we have to reach the fight to lean economy even the budget presented in in the february 2020 there was a high hope about this disinvestment high hope about this merger of the banks all of them started working on this way and an amendment also has brought in on very very important areas in the case of an nri the number of amendments they have brought in the amendments specially with reference to the individuals not with reference to the any of the other agencies the investment started pouring suddenly this amendment has created some sort of a problem in the mind of the nris whether i have to invest in india or not whether i have to come back to india or not whether i have to stay back outside india enjoy all the benefits and keep all my assets outside india the limits they specified about your local income about 15 lakhs about this number of stays to be reduced from 180 to 120 and the number of amendments about this nri investments are also created a big problem for the nris in fact once they presented in the budget present bill presented in the parliament the kerala chief minister is represented before the finance minister as well as the before the prime minister stating that there should be an amendment is required the nris are contributing the foreign exchange their investments are very important for the nation's growth but unfortunately it was not the correct way you have taken it up and you taxing the nri is not perfectly correct luckily certain amendment has taken place in the case of a final act in the parliament 
not that to the extent what they were expected but still there is a debatable points are coming up out of these things the non resident indians where there is an income earned outside india totally they are need not pay any tax in india and on not ordinarily resident their income outside india is not taxable however any business connection professional connections if there is a business set up it is to be taxed in the along with the indian income so the government has come out with the clarifications we are not going to tax the non residents on the income earned outside india but unfortunately the interpretations are going to come in such a manner the income earned by the non residents outside india can be also can be roped into indian tax system though there are double taxation avoidance agreements are available in spite of that there are number of disputes are happening because of the interpretation of these provisions you can see the supreme court has come out with a decision relating to the many cases how this interpretation has to be considered while interpreting the provisions of the intention of the provision and later on they have come out with heavily on the department but unfortunately today the department is always pro revenue they would like to tax the entire income in india in case even for a slightest interpretation is in favor of the department we all know that the interpretations under the indian tax laws vis a vis the interpretations arising out of double taxation agreements the double taxation agreement avoidance agreement has to be prevail prevail on these aspects unfortunately the implementation point of view from the international tax section perspective also the department is not able to come to reach a conclusion in a proper manner that is why the litigations are pending for example the transfer pricing provisions are interpreted in different manner by the department huge amount of transfer pricing cases are pending before the tribunal high court and as well as supreme court for an investment made by the nri in the form of a deposit in india their interest are exemption and they are giving an they are they are allowed to invest in the equities through the uh, proper channel and till they reach india they is not to be taxed capital gain exemption has to be given so many provisions are there the investment in the form of a opportunity for nri is now curtailed because of these provisions luckily we have mr worsawal is having a vast experience in the case of a taxation on nris and interpretation of the provisions relating to the nris the number of stay the stay with reference to the excess stay with reference to the various reasons and even for covid now the stay has been the government has uh, given certain uh, notifications even an excess stay can be considered to be not to be considered for the purpose of computing the number of days stay in india similarly the provisions relating to the sale of property in india i have seen certain questions the tax reduction is mandatory in india only in case if there is a capital loss what will happen that is the question has come you have to apply for the to the department for the no deduction or lesser deduction low deduction these are the uh, difficult inconvenient positions the nris are facing nowadays the investments are also now we can see that the market conditions are not conducive for a proper investments even there is a changes are taking place the nri is not aware of this what is happening in the market conditions naturally they have to guided by the investors they should support them to proper investments mr sony has told me that about the nris chartered accountants are coming back to india what are the business opportunities are opened up for them see many nri chartered accountants working in the dubai and all uae places they have a exposure to the administration exposure to the local laws but their exposure to the indian laws indian conditions are very less their opportunity cannot be in the form of a practice of indian laws unless they have a very strong background about the laws prevailing in india relating to taxation 
relating to insolvency and bankruptcy court, relating to the Indian Contract Act, relating to the interpretation of the various provisions under the Income Tax Act. Companies Act totally changed today. So the concept of technology is taking back the entire personal activities of the professions as on today. Today, the filing of an income tax returns anywhere in the world you can file your income tax returns. Outsourcing of a work started in India for the consultant in outside India, the Indian chartered accountants are providing support as an outsourcing point. Many Indian chartered accountants are providing support to the chartered accountants in USA and Australia by way of bringing out their filing of returns and consultancy they are providing to the other chartered accountants outside India. So in India, the another area which we have to understand that the Indian chartered accountant profession is now focusing on many areas, especially on the auditing standards, accounting standards, India's. All these things are to be clubbed together for listed companies, unlisted companies, private companies, private unlisted companies, public unlisted companies. All these things are now gearing up towards the accepting the Indian accounting standard and auditing standard. In fact, internationally, we have accepted the IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standard, which has been modified in India for the purpose of Indian conditions by our institute, which was accepted by the government and notified by the government Ministry of Corporate Affairs for an applicable to the certain entities. <coughs> you can take the entities like banking sector, it's wait, still waiting. Listed companies are accepting, they are all started their financial reporting with the India's applicability. And the changes are taking place, very fast changes are taking place in India. A chartered accountant who have vast experience working there in the, maybe in the outside India may not be immediately they can take up the any of this assignment in an individual capacity. So the opportunity for them of to strengthen their learning capacity and then strengthen their working capacity and then move with the certain big firms, join with them, work with them, learn and then you can have a, your own form, your own setup, you can do that. This is the form of a tax practices. The GST law more or less settled in India. GST law settled, income tax law settled, Companies Act new law settled, the insolvency and bankruptcy law settled. So all these law now has been combined together working in India. Very unfortunately, the situation in India is now the COVID-19 is totally changed the entire scenario of economic opportunities in India. Considering the present situation, the concessions given by the government to the MSMEs and also giving certain facilities for the existing borrowers for giving them the moratorium period and, and also providing them the EMI, postponement of EMI. All these things are helpful to the industry. But unfortunately, the moving of labor from one place to the other place, place has created again a problem in the case of a manufacturing sector. So considering the present situation, if a chartered accountant from Dubai want to come back to India, first of all, he has to prepare his own reserves in India. So the reserves should be at least is capable of withstand the present economic situation at least for about two years. So when you're bringing back your reserves, you must understand what is the resident, not ordinary resident, whether my reserves have to be taxed or I have to keep my reserves outside India. I will use the reserves in India by starting my practice or starting my own uh, business and all these things. The technology is the moving business in India now. World over, the Indians are the very strong technology survey. They're all the strong people in the technology. They were able to control the technology in this world. You take that many of them, the Google, IBM, all of the Indians are working there. They are able to control the technology world over. But unfortunately in India, the technology is now is bringing the Indians together. For example, you take this webinar. We never expected we are going to organize a webinar 
for the people in nri chartered accountants as well as the chartered accountants within india all the management consultants in india or the management association in india we never expected that today we are all discussing about many areas relating to the management investment nri taxation tax planning and all these things so the technology has changed the life of the indians today we are joining together bringing the technology into our in the home and we are working from home that's another area which we have to consider it so any chartered accountant is having a knowledge in technology strong foundation in technology he can work from dubai itself for an indian firms for indian investors for indians those who are interested to work in the dubai and other places and another area which we have to consider it the digital economy in india is growing now the institute also coming out with the digital accounting standard board so the e commerce which was a very slow progress in india now it is number one in india so everything you can get it online your presence is not required in everywhere very recently concluded bank audit conducted by our chartered accountants they were able to do the bank audit by not visiting the branches but by getting the information by way of internet possibilities through computers they were able to take the, all the documents verify it approve it they gave their own audit reports maybe with certain reservations similarly the abcd concept is picking up in india what is abcd concept a means an artificial intelligence that's a very important concept blockchain technology is also is coming up very fast in implementations and the cyber security data analyticals they're all very fast is happening in india so all these things is a strength for the chartered accountant if you come back if you want to start something in a newer manner you had to start a chartered accountant in bomb in bangalore very recently i heard and i met him also very long back they are having about 200 partners throughout india as well as outside india their office is one functioning only with laptops there is no single paper available in their office everything only by way of an internet transactions or maybe a banking transaction which is whatever they are taking place they are audit only by way of uh, through the computers nobody carry any papers except computers laptops so the 200 partners joining together running a firm with the technology platform it is a very important for us a chartered accountant with a very limited knowledge and technology cannot be going to serve in india so that is the present situation so the investment opportunities mr somsagar will definitely will give you an idea and tax planning and the residential status what is your position now as on today you are in a good position for coming back to india or not or you want to invest in india and you have to pay global tax or not so this is the very important uh, amendment which will be very helpful to all of us to understand on how to interpret the various provisions how to come back with this clutches of these provisions that's very important to all of us so with this i am thankful to mr soni and the team for this wonderful opportunity they have given to me to join this seminar interacting with all of you get the feedback from you what is happening in the world over related to the nr nri taxation so that we can take the measures we can take back all your queries or grievances we can pass this message through our ica to the finance ministry if possibly we have to give for maybe this this section may be postponed for one more year like that we can request them for till this covid 19 has to be settled fully with this i once again thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity thank you one and all thank you cag ramaswami sir for your excellent uh, speech the audience got a excellent idea about the how to go about in taxation as well as when they are going to set up their own practice how they should plan thanks a lot sir for joining with us amidst of your busy schedule we are running short of time so we right away go into the technical session nri taxation recent amendments by cp catp oswald sir all to you sir
Oswald sir is the encyclopedia of the taxation. Sri Ramaswamy ji, Mr. Soni, and other office bearers, my seniors, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great opportunity to deal with the subject and share my thoughts on the subject with fellow members, chart accountants in Dubai, chart accountants elsewhere, and in, in India. The subject given to me was recent amendment to the residential status of non-residents uh, under the Income Tax Act. The Finance Act 2020 amended the provision and that created a lot of tension amongst the just a minute how to run i'm seeing it okay uh, the provisions have been created this year and they are effective from the current year that is from 1st april 2020 to 21 will be the first impacting year so therefore, all these amendments which have been made are not going to have any impact till the last assessment up to 31st March 2020. So that is assessment year 2021. And all these amendments have been made to only one section, section 6 of the Income Tax Act. And you will have to understand the concept of taxation of non-residents under the Income Tax Act. I'll take you through everything. I'll explain you the nuances of the amendment made and also the areas of concerns, benefits, etc. And then I just now saw some questions have been sent to me. I think Mr. Sony has sent a set of questions, around 30, 40 questions. Time permitting, I'll deal with all. I have no problem in dealing with all these questions, though I have not read them earlier. Just now I saw on my phone, and I can deal with as many as possible. Now, as far as scope of this section, <coughs> scope of this presentation is concerned, I will deal with section six, the scope of the income as per, as far as non-residents are concerned, and background of section six, what made them to amend, and what is the impact of the amendment in the provisions of the of the section amendment to income tax act. Section six, as you all know, is a test which decides the residential status of an individual. Section 6 also deals with the residential status of companies, also HUF and partnerships and all other. We are not right now dealing with all other entities other than individual, but Section 6 was amended two years before to deal with the amendment for the companies. If the company is controlled from India, full par, control, controlled and managed from India, it was considered as resident. But in 17, they changed the law. Now they say we are not concerned with control and management. We are concerned with place of effective management. In other words, if the company is set up abroad, and now since the question, since the background I heard from all of you, that you are wanting to return to India, and therefore suppose a company is set up abroad, and if that company, when you are returning in India, and you are going to control that company, the place of all the decisions of that company are taken from India, then the place of effective management of that company becomes an Indian India. And once the company is having a place of effective management in India, then it will be resident of India. It will be liable to tax on its world income. And that is most, and, and, and this is not the Indian amendment. This is what the world is also trying to change their laws and the people are copying based on the OECD guidelines. So therefore, this is one major change one has to keep in mind. So whenever a person comes back to India try and has companies abroad, he should not control those companies. All commercial and management decisions of that company should be taken by people who, are, who should be appointed in that country and they take the decision. And now the issue is Indian revenue authorities are very intelligent. What they do is everybody these days is operating through computer and through technology. So when they come for search, when they come for survey, they just take your computer and copy the data and look at your emails, communication with other companies. And then they were, from that they can find out all the decisions are literally taken by you. Though on paper you are saying they are controlled and managed, they are all commercial and residential, commercial and management decisions are taken from foreign country. In reality, that is not correct. And therefore you run the risk of 
the foreign company being treated as a resident of india that care one has to take this is not this was not my subject today's subject but nevertheless i will uh, if there are any questions i will deal with all those questions as well around the world the residency of an individual is categorized as resident and non resident but in india we have three categories resident non resident and resident but not ordinary resident this is the category not found anywhere in the world reason being it is a safe harbor period if you are becoming resident uh, if you are becoming uh, uh, if you are a non resident and virtually you want to become resident uh, you are given two years time period so that you know in the two years time period you can arrange your affairs in a foreign country in such a manner that those incomes there are once you become fully resident you will, you can avoid taxation and that is the reason why resident but or not ordinary resident status is a category in india which helps people to remove the lot of difficulties that we will come to little later now if you look at we have history of the income tax act 1922 was the year when we started income tax act and under section 4a of the 1922 act we had at that time prior to independence in 1947 india had british controlled india and non british controlled india and there was a trade between british controlled india and non british controlled india and therefore the tussle of taxation used to happen even in those days the question arose is what is the residence shall status of a person it became uh, for testing before the privy council and uh, in india at that time the definition of uh, under 22 act was the if the person has a indian income more than a foreign income then he his he will be deemed to be the resident of india and of course those are not relevant but the matter was challenged before the court and the court said the constitutionally this is valid and therefore they are entitled to do that and that got power to income tax authorities in india to believe that they can do all changes in the income tax act and one of the reason why they have changed is uh, the the ch change in the income tax act is based on the income criteria you have got sir ramaswamy ji has explained that you have got income from uh, indian sources exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees then you can run a risk of becoming resident that is what we are going to see and the tax authorities when we talk to them they believe that we have necessary powers supreme court of india held it to be constitutional always company's decision is way back very old decision this is it is a valid and therefore it is the decision of 1948 and therefore we will still be able to tax you and therefore we can't fight a big battle with them but nevertheless we need to plan out our affairs in a proper manner before going to section 6 let's understand the scope of the income if you are purely resident of india india taxes the income of the resident like any other, all other country whole world income liable to tax in the hands of resident but i don't i i i withdraw my words whole of the world because you are living in the world where there is no tax you have number of countries where the taxation is on a totally different manner that is on a receipt basis uh, so they are like singapore receipt basis taxation or the hong kong accrual in the country is taxable nothing else outside accrual is not taxable so there are number of countries which are having a, its own taxation system but most of the countries in the world most of the countries tax the resident on the world income then what we have done in india from beginning a resident is taxable on income received in india income accruing in india income deemed to be received in india in, income deemed to accrue in india and income accruing and arising outside india everything is taxable here so therefore global income is taxable the resident and non resident i'll come to not ordinary resident little later non resident is taxable only in respect of income received in india deemed to be received in india accruing in india and deemed to accrue in india nothing more so therefore the concentration on non resident taxation is india centric income income concentration on taxation of resident is world income literally in between the two categories we have 
in between one category is not ordinary resident not ordinary resident is akin to but not necessarily exactly same akin to non resident he is also not taxable on its world income but only one category of the income has been treated as taxable if you have got any income arising outside india but it is derived from a business control or a profession set up in india for example i have set up my profession in india and i get the income abroad and i park that income abroad i have branches abroad still it will be income set up from profession in india or i have a set up business uh, set up in india and i have also branch of the businesses abroad i am not ordinary resident that income will be treated as taxable in india and therefore this issue is uh, uh, this is what is income controlled business controlled or a profession set up in india is still not defined and that is creating lot of issues and that has been a major uh, major issue for uh, discussion uh, during the current year in fact i gave two examples in my earlier lecture take the case of a, a person like uh, uh, harish salve who is an indian uh, citizen of india but now settled in uk when he set up his profession he started profession from india and therefore now today he is controlling that profession by sitting in uk can you say that it will be set up it will be said as profession set up in india it is a major issue therefore there is no clarification on that now if i am raising this issue for, in the name of harish salve possibly he is the one person who will be able to defend it before supreme court saying that my profession set up in india is different than my profession set up in uk and that can benefit all of us here section 2 sub section 30 defines non resident means a person who is not a resident and for the purpose of section 9 now no, this definition is very negatively put it a person is non resident means who is not a resident fine understandable but the benefit of that is extended in some sections sections 92 that is transfer pricing provisions 93 control companies uh, provision and section 163 person to be regarded as a agent of a foreign entity uh, 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 are also applicable only to the resident and not to not ordinary resident and and therefore this is a benefit to that extent is available to the person now <clears throat> i'm just seeing if it is not relevant i'll just pass it to faster now why calculating now person is regarded as resident of india i think this this section this issue will come up little later that's why i would like to park it and then come up as and when the discussion takes place in india please note one thing resident under the income tax act and resident under the foreign exchange management act we have two different acts there is both the section talk both the law talks of resident and non resident both are on a totally different footings they have nothing to do with each other income tax act regards the resident based on number of days stay no doubt the similar stay has been introduced under the foreign exchange management act they say under the foreign exchange management act residential number of days stay of the earlier year should be counted and not the current year in the case of income tax residential resident number of days stay should be of the current year should be counted and not of the previous earlier years and therefore there is major confusion which comes up and hence while calculating uh, while 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 deciding the taxation issues we should not mix up with the foreign exchange uh, issue foreign exchange management act issue of the residential definition both have different ramification all your investments made abroad received in india and made in india are subject to fema regulation but its income and taxation of that income is under the income tax act and therefore income tax act has a limited implication whereas fema has a larger implication why calculating number of days stay in india there are controversies which i would just like to take it here at this uh, point in time at times what happens when you go abroad from india you leave at 11 o'clock in the night your flight from dubai is at 10:30 and you leave at 10:30 the whole day you have been in india the question is whether you will be regarded that day when you have left india 
that whether that day will be counted as in india answer is yes now therefore people plan it out people leave immigration stamp they take it after 12 o'clock so that you are counted on the next day as only the the is in india and not the the day when you have actually literally left so therefore one should calculate carefully indian advance ruling authority all along have been taking a view like income tax department takes that when you have left india and when you arrived in india both the days should be treated as you are present in india whereas income tax tribunal has taken a view and consistently either of the days should be counted as in india and not both the days so therefore while planning you should calculate both the days to be in india the day when you have left and the day when you have arrived but if you are forced to have a litigation then in my opinion in the lit litigation situation you can defend yourself based on the tribunal decision and you have a better position um, following the tribunal decision then number of other concept like economic presence legal presence is irrelevant for the income tax purposes income tax purposes only says number of days stay that's all nothing else india does not so far did not regard citizenship as the basis of taxation we have two countries one is uh, uh, artia and second is usa usa is a major artia is a very small country very near sudan which is uh, not relevant but usa is only country in the world major country which taxes the citizen of usa irrespective of fact whether you are in usa whether you stay abroad we don't care you file your return here pay the tax here if you already paid the taxes abroad get a credit for those taxes in usa but you will have to file your return so citizenship is very relevant whereas in india citizenship either to was not at all relevant for the income tax purposes income tax just considered the definition of resident under section 6 of the income tax act and nothing more nothing less however during the year 2020 finance bill they have brought in the concept of citizenship for a limited purpose if you are a citizen of india and if you are not citizen of india then the question is how many days you can stay here and all these income what number of days criteria is uh, is decided under the law and there are reasons to do that we will come to that when we come to the relevant portion very interesting discussion on that because uh, this is very very important the importance of the double taxation avoidance agreement still continues unfortunately or sometimes maybe fortunately the treaty with dubai has a definition of dubai uh, uh, resident is totally different than the definition of resident under all other tax treaties india has india's only unique treaty with the uh, one or two treaties where the number of days stay is considered as a residential status as a resident of that country for example in dubai treaty you say if you are in dubai for more than 183 days you are a resident of dubai or uae and uh, not the on the basis of uh, 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 domicile or any other criteria of the similar nature whereas all other countries the definition is different however if you are a resident of two countries suppose by virtue of your stay in dubai you are resident and in india also by virtue of number of days presence in india you become resident so in therefore in in a situation like dubai it is possible to avoid because there is 183 days test in dubai whereas in india also 182 days test so so if so therefore if you have more than 182 days you become resident so the, you can't be except in the leap year like this current year you can be resident in two countries 183 days in dubai and 183 days in india then you become resident of both the countries and in such a situation you have article 4 sub article 2 of the treaty which says if you are a resident of more than two more than one country or you are resident of both the countries then the tie breaking test is provided under that treaty and this is where is your habitual abode first condition then that is the basis where you will be taken as a resident but you say i am a habitual i have an habitual abode in both the countries okay in that event where is the center of vital interest you have got you are employed abroad you are earning abroad 
and their and your family is abroad and your economic nexus is abroad so therefore generally the tie breaking test should be in favor of that country where all these economic nexus exist but if suppose you you say your your facts also suggest that your parents are in india some of the children are studying in india then economic and your investments are also in india the economic nexus also could be in favor of india and therefore you can be regarded as a resident of india so in such a situation a dice test is the third test comes to the rescue where is your permanent home available and if your permanent home is in a foreign country then you can still be out of the india and therefore not liable to tax the fourth test is risky for you because dubai does not allow uh, the passport of that country the indian passport you are holding and therefore last fourth criteria fifth criteria fourth criteria is where of which country you are a citizen you will be regarded as a resident but first three criteria should satisfy so that you will become resident of that country and then once you become resident of that country india takes a view india has taken a view if you are resident of foreign country you will be regarded as non resident of india under the treaty and for all the purposes and therefore this becomes beneficial now what happened what was the reason for amendment to section 6 of the income tax act in india modification in residential status now existing rule of course everybody knows i don't have to uh, labor much about it to explain if you are abroad if you are in india less than 182 days uh, you are uh, you are non resident if you are in india uh, less than 182 days in india means more than 182 abroad if you are in india for less, uh, more than one for more than 60 days and in the preceding four previous years more than 365 days in year then you will become resident of india in other words uh, however very interestingly so far the 60 days criteria was replaced by 182 days virtually everywhere the 182 if you are living in india for the first time for the purpose of employment if you are a member of the crew on a indian ship or any other ship then you are living in india and you are a citizen of india then 182 days gets replaced to in place of 60 days and therefore virtually you become a you become non resident if you are abroad for more than 182 days so if you are more than 182 days in india then only you can become resident of india not otherwise and thirdly if you are non resident and you are coming to visit to india this was law till last year if you are coming to visit to india for more than uh, sorry less than 182 days during the year then you also become non resident you are not required to be called as a resident interesting uh, decisions which have come in on this particular last aspect if you are non resident abroad and coming to india for visit and then in that case you are permanently coming back and not uh, not going back at all then in that case you will you will not get the advantage of 182 days because you come back your your number of days in india are 80 more than 60 days and therefore you will be hitting there in the earlier clause and therefore uh, therefore in a case where you are returning back to india at least ensure in that year you are in india for less than 60 days or you are in india uh, even if it is exceeding uh, 100 days or more than that and you are uh, say if you are in india up to uh, say 182 days you are in india and then just last few days you are in india go out and then come back in the next year advisable course will be not to come and settle immediately ensure that your residential status planning is done properly i'll explain this again little later but the law is now changed what is the rational behind changing the law what happened you know the one, one people used to have one interesting tax planning uh, a spanish citizen a indian spanish citizen origin origin person of indian origin having uh, fully settled in spain having uh, office and also the uh, residence in dubai having residence in london and having also residence in some other country in hong kong and he is staying in each of the country for a particular threshold number of days for example uk consider less than 90 days stay even if you have a residential house there you are not a domicile or you are not a resident in spain 182 days criteria was there so therefore you will stay there for say 100 days 
in UK you will stay for say 75 days and then uh, in India you come and stay for say 180, uh, 180 days and then few more days in Dubai and some other countries. So by way of this you plan out your affairs in such a manner that you visit all other countries all over the world and don't be uh, tax resident of any of the country. You are paying taxes on incomes in earned in those countries only on that income you pay the tax if the income tax is levyable on non-resident in respect of those income. But you will take advantage. You will take the advantage of the provisions like Indian law where the non-resident is allowed to invest and earn income and not liable to tax and therefore you will not be taxable at all. Or you will keep your investment in a country like UAE and there earn income or uh, income therefrom, and you will not be taxable. Interest earned by a non-resident in UK also is not taxable in UK. Singapore also is not taxable. So in Hong Kong is also not taxable. So you will work out the situation of world situation and then say I am not taxable anywhere. So such persons are called as stateless person. You, they don't have any state. In such a situation, how to tax them? This was a global problem. And when they found this is a global problem, OECD and all other countries started working out a plan how to tax them. And now you can see, you know, uh, the income disclosure schemes, the foreign assets disclosure schemes, cross exchange of information programs, which countries and countries are running under the guidance of the OECD are major source, major problematic areas to catch hold of people who are not reporting their income properly. I, this is not applicable to you because in UAE there is no tax at all. On the contrary, to protect yourself, people take the citizens, people take the shelter of Dubai and stay there. Of course, in a situation like COVID, that is a problem. I'm not suggesting anything on account of that. But that used to be the tax planning technique. People would have some uh, residence permit and park their income, park their, uh, park their uh, profit there. So, but now under the exchange of information program, country by country reporting, world over, these problems are getting uh, narrowed down gradually, slowly. And this is under the global program, OECD is directing the world. India is also uh, under their influence and control. But because of that, <clears throat> because we also wanted to tax these non-residents who are leaving India. And you see what happened in last three years when we created the uh, Black Money Act in India, 2015, India introduced Black Money Act. And the Black Money Act uh, thrust was a resident, a non-resident, a person who becomes non-resident, he was skipping the application of Black Money Act. Uh, Black Money Act was applicable to a resident. If It means if you have parked your money abroad and thereafter you became resident, the government of India was not in a position to do anything. Of course, last year they amended the law retrospectively saying that you can be still caught if the uh, if the monies which you have earned abroad, uh, monies which have not disclosed to the Indian tax authorities but earned abroad and parked stashed abroad. In that case, you will ca we will catch you provided that income was earned when you were resident, even prior to becoming non-resident. And earlier the, it was a complete ban, but now they have said uh, retrospectively we can tax you. So therefore, this is one area of concern which Black Money Act uh, introduced. And gradually then they got, people realized that if this is the case, let us become non-resident, let us become non-citizen of India. And there was huge movement of people getting out from the country and going to other tax haven countries or going to the countries where low tax jurisdiction, low tax countries uh, and that they are taking up either citizenship or shifting their residence. Uh, which was going on and almost uh, 20,000 people who are high net worth individual have shifted India, uh, shifted from India and went abroad. And to catch them, uh, the government was trying to plug the loopholes and catch them and try to work out scenario whereby they will be caught in the net. One of the themes seems to be 183 days was a very long period, six months period. People would come and stay in India and then there, thereafter they will go abroad and stay abroad for uh, more than 183 days and therefore you will still be non-resident. So they have curtailed the period of 
183 days to uh, 182 days to 120 days. I'll come to that now. What is the provision earlier, which I made explained to you earlier, that if you stay more than 182 days in India, then you are resident. Second condition is if you stay more than 60 days in that year, and in the preceding four previous years, more than 365 days, then cumulatively, then you become resident. Now, in play, particularly, there are two exceptions. If you are living in India, if you are leaving India for the purpose of employment abroad, or you are a member of the crew, then instead of 60 days, you are allowed to stay in India up to 182 days. Now, this uh, uh, the, in this clause of 160, sorry. And secondly, if you are coming back on a visit, in a visit to India, when you are non-resident and you are wanting to come back and uh, you have a personal economic connections, tie up, uh, medical facilities, your business here, your relatives are here, you want to meet them for marriages, etc. Because you are ultimately Indian. So you are coming back to India, person of Indian origin or citizen of India, they are allowed to give, allowed to be coming back and allowed to stay in India for 182 days, which they have changed to 120 days. This is a major change which has happened. And therefore, whenever the word 60 days was used, there 180 day was permitted to stay here and not more than 182 days. However, there was huge hue and cry, hue and cry. Dubai residents, particularly Middle East people, made big noise and the government came down and government tried to change this regulation. And now the effect of the change in the regulation is, in case if you are coming back for the visit to India, you are allowed to stay in India up to 120 days if your total income liable to tax in India is more than 15 lakhs of rupees. Other than foreign income, foreign source income is not taxable at all here. But if your income from India is exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees, then you are allowed to stay only up to 120 days. So this that was the reason I gave you earlier of the Privy Council's decision, income criteria and citizenship criteria has become relevant now. I'll explain now in that context. But if your income is less than 15 lakhs of rupees, total income, I'm saying the word total income, and the total income is the term defined under the Income Tax Act. Total income exceeds one, uh, 15 lakhs of uh, exceed 15 lakhs of rupees, you can stay up to 120 days. But if you're Total income is less than 15 lakhs of rupees. Still, you can continue to stay in India for 182 days without any problem. So, therefore, the intention, uh, sorry, uh, therefore, it is, it is possible for you to still stay in India to up to 182 days when you come for visit, provided your income in India is less than 15 lakhs of rupees. Now, question is, what is the income which is less than 15 lakhs of rupees? For example, your NRI deposits here, FCNR deposits, interest earned thereon is not taxable. And it is not taxable, therefore it is not included in the total income. So the total income means only taxable total income. What is not taxable is not relevant. Forget about it. Now, for example, you have got an income. When you calculate your total income, and therefrom you give deductions, donations, etc. That also should be deducted and net total income should be calculated. If net total income is less, more than 15 lakhs of rupees, then only you become resident if your stay exceeds 120 days. If your stay is less than uh, 120 days, you are non-resident, not, not to bother. But if your income exceeds 15 lakhs, you become resident. However, New criteria, which, uh, new criteria which have been added is deemed residency, which will come to later. Then, if you have got any income which is more less than one, uh, one oh, sorry, uh, fifteen less than fifteen lakhs of rupees, then your total stay in India permitted is hundred and eighty-two days. That still continues. So this applies to citizen of India and person of Indian origin only. The non-citizens, the non, uh, the non-citizen of India. They are not covered by these exceptions. They will be still covered by the provisions of 60 days stay in India only and not more than that. The, the existing rule, as I said earlier, only it applies only up to assessment year uh, 21, uh, 2021. That is uh, 
new rule will apply from the current year onward and therefore this only this the new rule was created for the stateless persons they were not taxable they were roaming around in the world having income everywhere not paying taxes anywhere and therefore they india wanted to tax uh, catch hold of them and get it taxed here and this was also based on some scientific study indian government did it and because most of the people started going out of the country which were all high net worth individual and the government wanted to catch hold of uh, their the taxes their taxation in india so 15 lakhs of rupees the question so there was some question which has been put on this uh, on, on this uh, uh, forum i will try to take up those questions at the end and i'll answer 15 lakhs of rupees let me repeat it again 15 lakhs of rupees income which is taxable income and not the exempted income you exclude exempt exempted income for example prior to going to dubai or abroad you had an agricultural plot here and on which you are getting an agricultural income because once you become resident non resident you cannot hold the you cannot acquire agricultural land prior to that you had an agricultural land and you continuously use somebody to get the agricultural income agricultural incomes are not taxable in india and therefore it doesn't the total income and that that no problem now section 6 therefore uh, uh, further to uh, the amendment which we have discussed a new criteria which was created in the income tax act and that is says in the section subsection 1a which has been proposed it says not withstanding anything contained in subsection 1 an individual being citizen of india shall be deemed to the deemed to be the resident of india deeming deemed resident of india is a new criteria which have been added in the previous year if he is not liable to tax in any other country uh, uh, or territory by reasons of his domicile residence or any other criteria of similar nature so therefore if, if you are a citizen of india and you are staying abroad and you are not taxable anywhere in the world not liable to tax in the world then you will be regarded as a, say, a resident of india and liable to tax in india now this has created lot of tension lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, problem and all of sudden when this was introduced immediately central board of direct taxes created a clarification saying that this will not apply to the uae resident and therefore this was an amendment proposed which lived only for say 10 days or 15 days because the law was again on 23rd uh, march was amended and thereafter the new pro new provision which have come into effect was like this it again they brought in the concept of the uh, 15 lakhs of rupees income for deemed resident as well what the law says now after amendment full fledged amendment that earlier was a draft amendment now the the amendment which has been brought the notwithstanding anything contained in sub clause 1 an individual being citizen of india having total income other than income from foreign sources exceeding uh, exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees other than income from foreign sources again an undefined term but we shall assume that indian income therefore an indian income exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees during the previous year shall be deemed to be the resident of india in that previous year as if he is not liable to tax in uh, Uh, sorry if he is not liable to tax in any other country or territory by reasons of his domicile residency or any other criteria of the similar nature in uh, in uh, in in case of dubai these criteria are not applicable the criteria in dubai is only 183 days stay now question is what is liable to tax in the in any other country the term liable to tax in a country is different then term subject to tax in another country subject to tax in the country means you are physically taxable as per the law of that country but not liable to tax means the country the taxation is a sovereign right of each country whether the country wants to tax or not to tax is that choice of that country you cannot impose on the world every every country must tax everybody now country like uae does not tax an individual the country like uae taxes only the non resident banking companies and non resident exploration of oil companies there is an income tax act which exists in dubai but only in respect of these two type of countries a uh, companies not other other individuals individuals are exempted so therefore 
<clears throat> Similar is the case with the other Middle East countries. They tax the companies. They don't tax individuals. Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman, they don't tax individuals. So therefore, the issue is whether the cons person concerned will be treated as liable to tax therein. The, very interestingly, we have uh, advanced ruling decisions, we have a tribunal decisions, and we have Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court of India, in the case of Azadi Bachao Andolan, uh, a decision 263 ITR page 5, which are where the, they have taken a view. I have quoted all those decisions subsequently in uh, appropriate places. You will find them. I will also, uh, when it comes to, I will again repeat it. Uh, they have said, the term liable to tax means you are uh, you are potentially liable to tax in that country. It is not necessarily liable to tax means there must be an assessment made on you. You should file your return of income and you should pay some tax or may, may file your return as exempted. It's not necessary. So potential tax, as and when the country decides to levy tax, they will tax you. Till then, the country has, uh, uh, the, the country has exempted you and therefore you're not taxing, you're not paying any tax doesn't mean that you are not liable to tax therein. You are taxable, but country has chosen not to tax because that country does not need that big uh, uh, revenue uh, for the purpose of managing that country. And therefore, the term liable to tax is a very, uh, uh, very well-defined term as far as India is concerned. And Supreme Court, though the revenue is now objecting because now they find whatever amendment they have made, we brought out this to them, their attention immediately after the amendment. Now, what can they do? Nothing. And therefore, they said, no, no, this is not our intention. This is that. Uh, the, our intention is to not give exemption. But whatever they may argue, ultimately, Supreme Court of India's decision is a law of land. And therefore, it is binding on everybody. And Supreme Court said libel to tax means you are, you, you are staying there by virtue of whatever criteria because of your staying there. That country has a right of taxation. They levy the tax or not is not our concern and therefore you are liable to tax. You will be treated as liable to tax in your country where you are staying and hence you will get the advantage and you will not be deemed to be resident of India. Of course, this is what our interpretation and this is very valid, legitimate uh, interpretation on the subject and we have given this same, same view to number of, uh, the, uh, the number of citizens, number of people who have sought our opinion on the subject. And they will not be treated as taxable in India. But this matter again, if the, the revenue wrecks up, and we have, I have no hesitation in saying that you have, uh, you have excellent case to succeed before the before higher authorities. This was a proposed amendment. I didn't want to. I don't want to waste your time. I come to the straightway amendment made in the Income Tax Act, and that amendment is exactly what I discussed. Uh, they said uh, again to become a resident but not ordinary resident, you have uh, three criteria. Earlier there were two criteria. Now we have three criteria. One, that you should be non-resident for nine out of ten previous years. You are a non-resident for nine years. Then for next two years, you will be not ordinary resident. Second criteria is if you are in last preceding seven years, you are in India for only 729 days, then also you will be non you will be treated as not ordinary resident for next two years now third criteria is c and d stayed in india in a previous year for more than 120 days but less than 182 days and, and you do not have foreign income exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees then oh, sorry you do not have indian income exceeding 15 lakhs of rupees other than foreign income then again you will be treated as resident but not ordinary resident now, there, there is some problem because of this type of criteria which have been added. You will be resident but not ordinary resident, but therefore you will not be non-resident totally. Whereas if the earlier only two conditions would have continued, you would have been non-resident. So you had a continuous period of non-residentship for more than, say, suppose eight years are over and ninth year you fix it in this uh, C, category C, then you have break of nine years. Uh, sorry, your your break of ten out, nine out of ten years gets come, broken. You remain only in India for eight years, and there you will be impacted. So therefore, this was one uh, obnoxious condition which have been introduced. I think it is necessary for even all the non-resident. The government only listens to non-residents. The uh, Ramaswamy said rightly said 
you people have made big noise as a result the government came down partially and it is necessary for you people to make representation saying that this is not acceptable is unfair and as rightly said your whole major source of uh, the india foreign exchange reserves is all coming from non resident community and therefore today we are so comfortable foreign exchange reserves we are sitting on 508 billion dollar we have crossed half a million dollar reserves in india and that is substantial contribution goes to people like you and therefore you have political clout you should be able to represent to the government the individual therefore all stateless persons will become uh, will fall under this category 1a and therefore they will become resident but not ordinary resident so once you become resident but not ordinary resident consequences are very interesting you will not be taxable on world income you will be still taxable only in indian income then what is the need of having this category indian income anyway you are paying taxes if there is a taxable in india if it is not taxable anyway you are not paying taxes it is not required to be paying taxes so therefore this category was absolutely nonsensical not required to be added but we have this condition and that can create problems because that can that can create a problem of uh, continuous non resident ship of 9 years out of 10 years that will get impacted and also there are some other impact of this which we will come to later on but once you are a non resident and not ordinary resident the some of the benefits which are available still will continue to be available to you and therefore we will come to that as a separate uh, slide which i have added by way of issues uh, which i will discuss with you sir which i will discuss later on uh, well this is all repetition so i will not waste your time uh, residential test before the law was changed the residential status after the law got changed and there is new criteria india brought in to become not ordinary resident a concept of deemed residency which is based on the citizenship criteria if you are not citizen of india then this uh, this criteria of only 15 lakhs of rupees income applies not ordinary resident principle will not apply now the, uh, the, the there are impact of that amendment is here which i am coming to increase in the scope of income the income from business controlled and profession set up in india by virtue of your becoming not ordinary resident becomes taxable but if you are a non resident that income would not be taxable at all So therefore this comes under the clutches of the taxation and this is one adverse impact and when it comes to resident but not ordinary resident though you are a non resident for the purpose of uh, 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 for, uh, and you are deemed resident in that case what will happen there are certain concessional rate of taxes which are applicable to you under the exemptions uh, are available to non resident uh, not to not ordinary resident that will get impacted and some concessional rate of tax will be not available to you the double taxation avoidance agreements uh, which are beneficial to some extent they may get impacted the rate of tax for example you have an interest income here in india and the rate of tax under the double taxation avoidance agreement between india and dubai is 12 and a half percent on interest not 35% that will get impacted if you become resident but not ordinary resident it will become taxable at the full rate because then they will not give you treaty benefit presumption of control of a firm hqf uh, in india that is also a problematic area overall reduction in number of years of non residential status uh, for returning indians that i have already discussed out of block of 10 years suppose you have just finished a 9 years 8 uh, years and 9th year you are falling in this category you will lose that 9 years continuity the continuity is not relevant 9 out of 10 years there could be break in one year but suppose the break has already taken place earlier then this could impact you clearly within the tax compliance of the framework so once you become resident and ordinary resident then tax deduction at source will be will be uh, and filing of return in respect of the that income will become relevant tax compliance framework will become relevant the seafarers would be adversely affected on their income those who are going abroad and their specific relief provided by the loss of the indirect transfer exemption on sale of units of fpi which is available under the explanation 7 to the non resident but not this is not available to not ordinary resident and therefore to that extent you will get impacted 
the benefits of the non resident uh, not ordinary resident status there are some benefits also which are available the slab rate available to the senior citizens will be available to you the tds deduction uh, under section 195 for example you have property in india and you want to sell that property and you are non resident the full rate of tax they will deduct but if you are a resident but not ordinary resident and your taxable income is uh, is not fully taxable you can apply for lower rate of tax you don't have to go to the tax authorities you can ask the payer i am a resident only and therefore not to deduct tax i'll file my return of income that benefit is available to you and then next is you are uh, entitled to if suppose you are resident and ordinary resident and you have got a foreign income in foreign country you can and that is taxable in india by virtue of any reason then you can get a foreign tax credit as well uh, you can also avail concessional rate of uh, uh, dta in other country for example you become resident and ordinary resident and you have got a foreign income in foreign country you can ask for lower rate of tax if the rate of tax is lower of course in uh, dubai there is no tax but in any other other country the relaxation of reporting now if you are a resident but not ordinary resident foreign assets are not required to be reported in the return of income only the non resident uh, sorry only resident pure residents are required to disclose their foreign assets in the return of income and not not ordinary resident or non resident non non resident and not ordinary residents will not be required to report their foreign assets in the return of income schedule fa of the income tax uh, income tax return and that benefit still continue to be available to you accessing the dta treaty network for foreign source income will be available to you if you become a not ordinary resident some of the some of the in, impact which are neutral there is no obligation on reporting foreign assets which i told you not ordinary resident will be treated as non resident for the purpose of determining transfer pricing provisions and for the purpose of determining application of section 93 that is uh, where the, uh, the the transactions of transfer takes place between two associated enterprise major changes under the fema residential status due to changes in the tax uh, tax residential state no changes in the uh, fema residential status because of the res resident but not ordinary uh, resident black money act i have already explained to you now the law has been changed retrospectively a person becoming non resident uh, the, the the crime committed prior to becoming non resident now the government says we can catch hold we can tax you but the law when 2015 the law was introduced the crime committed prior to becoming non resident was not subject matter of uh, the, uh, the uh, cons any consequences which was not liable to be covered at all the ua treaty all other aspects i have already dealt with under the india ua tax treaty the condition of becoming non resident and becoming resident of dubai is or the dubai ua is stay in that country for more than 183 days then of course i understand the finance ministry of uae is giving uh, tax residency certificate for those people who are even staying less than 183 days uh, that may be relevant or not relevant but when it comes to you are taking position qua india india is entitled to examine this thoroughly and if you are less than 183 days in dubai they can deny you the treaty benefit the treaty benefit can be denied and the impact would be if you are taking a concessional rate of tax under the dubai india tax treaty that treaty benefit will be denied and nothing else there are no other consequences which will be relevant for the purpose of stay of 183 days or more or a concessional rate or for example you are claiming yourself to be the resident and but you are not a resident of dubai by virtue of this clause then any income which you are earning from india that could be subject matter of uh, not concessional rate full rate of tax will apply and that will be the major major disadvantage which you may suffer on account of this implication friend with this i will stop here and i will try to take questions in case time permitting after the next speaker completes his talk and thereafter if uh, if the organizers have no difficulty i can prolong my speech little uh, explanation little later explaining all the questions i give my uh, i try my best to give you all the answers thank you very much you, for sir. listening to patient yeah thank you sir shall we take the questions now you want you want okay. to take right now you can yeah, yeah.
we want to take after the next speaker i am i am available i have no okay, problem okay 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 uh, we'll take the questions now okay okay one or two questions we will uh, take up now then uh, okay fine okay. so because, because this questions i think you have sent me the questions yeah, very yeah. interesting questions yeah. but i don't think the question answer session can cover up all 24 yeah, questions yeah, yeah. for answer but <laughs> if you want some special session yeah. for this i don't mind uh, uh, giving coming back again on the zoom and giving you answers for all the questions which okay. are okay, very okay. interesting practical and day to day questions Exactly. Great of you, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions now, then move to the next uh, speaker. And we time permits, we'll take the balance questions. Uh, sure. First question is: uh, If a returning NRI plans to continue his visa in foreign country and may visit UAE for three, four times a year, is his details of bank accounts in UAE to be declared to IT department? he may continue his service remotely to the company in uae and its earnings will be credited in his bank account in uae as he has to visit uae many times a year he will have to spend a portion of his income in uae is the money credited to his in his account in a uae bank will be taxable in india or he can claim the expense from it and tax will be payable only on portion of portion he remitted to india very interesting real real life scenario this happens but uh, the question is remotely when you are saying i assume remotely from india if it is services are rendered to that company in uae remotely from <laughs> india and you are staying virtually in india and doing all the activities you will be resident and therefore once you are a resident under the income tax act because your residence should stay exceeds 182 days but if you are staying visiting dubai five times in a year and your number of days total stay in dubai exceeds 182 days 83 days in that case then you cease to be resident of india you will be non resident now the question is i'll give you implication both ways if you have got if you stay in india and remotely rendering all these services and you are casually going to dubai for one two days and resolving all the problems and coming back five times in a year so 10 days or so then in that case there is no doubt that you are a resident of india and you have taken you have opened your company abroad you have opened your bank bank account abroad you are earning your income from dubai activities and crediting that account it will be your obligation to bring back that income within india uh, uh, within in, uh, to within uh, to to india back to india within 30 days of crediting to your bank account because it is your obligation under the foreign exchange management act that income earned by a resident abroad cannot be maintained in a foreign country unless you take reserve bank of india's permission and rbi says okay you are permitted to can maintain the account and give yearly account to us and bring back the money only at the end of the year then is a different story otherwise you have to get the money back in india uh, back in india you are entitled to spend the money for the day to day expenses there also there is no problem but you have to report all those expenses also to the, to the reserve bank of india and therefore once you are a resident consequences are different but by virtue of your stay abroad maybe not necessarily in india not necessarily in dubai number of other countries anywhere wherever you are global travelers and you are rendering services remotely to the dubai company and you have ensured that you are not in india for more than 182 days then you are non resident of india because you are employed in a foreign country and once you are employed in a foreign country your earnings abroad can be retained abroad you can spend lavishly without difficulties of rbi's control and you don't have to bring back that money into the country your earnings abroad as a non resident you can retain abroad and you can invest out of that also in abroad in foreign country or even in india there is no restrictions but your residential status under the fema must be non resident if you are a non resident you are free bird under the fema if you are a non resident under india under the income tax act you are free bird from taxation purposes but if you are a resident in india for income tax purposes uh, then everything has to be uh, the taxable here but you are a non resident under the fema and resident of india uh, under the income tax act you can retain your income abroad and pay the tax in india 
and still retain the balance net proceeds out of india both the, you can take advantage of both the world all the situations are uh, has to be looked into differently separately in respect of each situation okay thank you sir thank you we'll take uh, one more question now yeah uh, this is a question from george from dubai mm. if you have a property in uae mm. and get regular rental income mm. what happens once an nri becomes resident in india mm. and how this uh, income is treated whether this rental income will be charged to indian income tax this is the yes. question from john dubai yeah if you become resident purely resident if you become resident but not ordinary resident that income still will not be taxable it will be uh, will be out of tax net in india but you assuming you become purely resident of india then india will have a right to tax on the world income including the income from foreign rent of a property situated abroad and then that rental income will be taxable here and you will have to of course you have invested into that property when you were non resident you are entitled to keep the rent abroad in your bank account there is no reason why you have to bring it back into the country but income tax you will have to pay in india on that income so your reporting will be required when you required to file your return as a pure resident you will report your foreign assets you will also report corresponding income from that into income tax return and there will be cross tally income tax department will tally it and therefore and not only that nowadays you have very interesting uh, situation the countries are countries are communicating with other country there is a exchange of information program under the exchange of information program the indian revenue authorities writing to the uae revenue authorities uae authority finance ministry get the information about this person and in his in respect of his bank account in respect of this property how much income he has the revenue the finance finance ministry of your country can ask this information to you and submit it to the indian authorities provided you are resident of india you are resident of dubai you are resident of that country no authority will ask any information to you to submit to the other country because it is nobody's interest to submit information about residents to some other country and therefore lot of people are becoming resident of uae only for this reason thank you sir thank you thank you uh, okay. it was an excellent session uh, the number of questions balance remains will take at least uh, one to two hours to answer uh, time permits we will take all these questions at end of the uh, next session now we are moving to uh, next session Oswal sir, thanks a lot for your thank excellent and marvelous presentation. We are all excited, but uh, due to the paucity of time, we are restricted now. And we'll time permits. We'll go for the first answer. Okay. No, no issue, no issue. And if you want to really create a separate session only for question answers, I am available. I can render you okay. all the services. Nice of you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And thank yeah, you. moving to next session. Uh, actually, this. This is a time now. The first session is supposed to be wind up. That time only we are starting the next session by Soma Sagaran, former Vice President of Head Resource Management, uh, Treasury of uh, Axis Bank. Uh, he has vast experience in banking for uh, 40 years and very specific in expert in FEMA and regulatory areas. All to you, Soma Sagaran, sir. Uh, I think uh, now we are about 8.22. So, sir, sir, unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, I am elated, in fact, to be amongst uh, the two great speakers specialized in their own uh, areas. Mr. Oswalji, thank you very much for a detailed uh, discussion on the various parameters and the guidelines, which has benefited, I am sure, uh, for all the shared accountants. And my session, though I had uh, thought of uh, a detailed uh, guidelines, what I'll do is I have taken the questions which you had sent across through Mr. Sony. So my session will be mainly on uh, answering those questions in the form of, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, compliance to the regulatory guidelines, as well as what are the practical 
problems or practical difficulties that an NRI is facing while handling the transactions with the banks. So we'll go straight away uh, because FEMA is a very big subject. In fact, uh, at Trichur for the ICA chapter of Trichur, I had conducted a full day program on uh, regulatory guidelines connected to NRI. But today, because of the time constraints, I would just restrict to some of the basic points. At the same time, I will be making a passing reference to uh, as a NRI, what are the things you need to keep in mind? So first I will take about the NRO account, the non-resident ordinary account. So here my experience is that an NRI when he is living abroad, when he is living for abroad, he will not prioritize designating his existing resident account into a non-resident ordinary account. So as a banker, I face many problems in this regard because as a person, you are a non-resident, but you are maintaining a resident account in the bank. So here that might uh, pose a question in terms of compliance. So the existing account has to be necessarily redesignated as a non-resident ordinary account to ensure that the spirit of the guideline is adhered to because the income earned in India by the Australian resident is taxable differently as compared to the income earned by the NRI when he is overseas. So here, what I would suggest is redesignate the account to NRO and maintain as minimum balance as possible so that you may not be levied with taxes on this account. That is the first point which I thought I will uh, narrate here. The second point which I come across from many of the NRIs is they remit money to the NRO account wherever there is an inward remittance. Many of the NRIs, maybe I'm not telling about the UAE segment, but I come across in my experience, the remittances come to the NRO account. So which we suggest the customers not to do this because NRO is a tax chargeable account. So have a NRE account. Many of the NRIs do have the non-resident external accounts. So bring the remittances into the NRE account the pack because the balances, the interest earned on the balances are exempt from tax. So this is the second point, which I thought I will uh, uh, point out here. So that wherever a customer, say your client, is remitting money to the NRO account, we generally desist from this practice because this is not an encouraging sign. So bring the amount to the NRE account so that there are two advantages here. One is as a NRI, you get the benefit of taxes in this account. The interest earned are exempt from tax. But as a banker, I have a benefit because whatever balances are there in the NRE, FC, NRB accounts, the bank need not maintain CRR balances. To the extent of the balances in the FC, NRB and the NRE, the bank is exempt from maintaining the CRR, cash reserve ratio balances. So there also I take an advantage as a banker. The third point is about joint accounts. So there was a question about this. So joint accounts are permitted with a resident as well as with other NRIs. But keep in mind, wherever a NRI wants to have a joint account with a resident, the NRI should be the first applicant and the resident should be the second applicant. Of course, wherever both the NRIs open a joint account, there is no uh, restriction. Since both of you are NRIs, you get the eligibility, the foreign exchange entitlement account will be the joint account because both the account holders are NRIs. Now coming to NRE accounts, non-resident external accounts. This is one where we term it as a foreign exchange entitlement account because the balances here, the interest earned on these balances are completely exempt from tax. The point which I come across practically is many of the NRIs, they bring currency notes. So whenever they bring foreign currency notes, or even for that matter, traveler's checks, because today's uh, scenario, the volume under traveler's checks has come down. So wherever you are bringing in currency notes, there is a regulation under FEMA that a person coming into the country with more than $5,000 currency notes or traveler's checks and currency notes put together more than $10,000, you have to declare to the immigration authorities through a form called the currency declaration form. So if by oversight, you are not doing this 
and when you come and encash these currency notes with the bank bank generally will be asking for the cdf form because that has to be endorsed again by the bank that the nri has encashed these currency notes so keep in mind wherever you are coming with currency notes of more than $5000 or equivalent in other currencies or wherever you are coming up with travelers checks up to 10 000, more than $10000 you need to declare through the currency declaration form and that needs to be provided either to the bank where you are converting into rupees or to the authorized money changer so that the necessary endorsements will be made and you will be getting back the original so this is one area where i have seen the compliance is uh, uh, required and i would request pass on this message because or you do one thing don't bring currency notes more than five thousand dollars that will be again one more uh, suggestion so that the risk also will be mitigated now repatriation of balances so when it comes to repatriation of balances regulations permit repatriation either by way of outward remittance from the nro account or you can even transfer from the nro to the nre account but in both the cases form 15 cacb is mandatory so you can repatriate you can transfer the amount from nro to nre but there is a limit fixed to this a maximum of us dollars 1 million in a financial year now again coming to joint accounts of nre wherever the customer has a joint account again i repeat <laughs> make yourself as the first applicant let the nri be the first applicant followed by the second applicant being the recipient now again one more practical uh, uh, aspect which many of the nris uh, face is in respect of settlement of claims wherever an nri has opened accounts please ensure that the account is having nomination you have to nominate the nomination can be either a resident nominee or he can be a non resident nominee so the problem will not arise where the res a nominee is a non resident so wherever the non resident nominee is tagged to the account on the death of the nri the claims are settled to the non resident nominee so there can be an outward remittance on the balances and wherever the resident is a nominee here keep in mind if the resident nominee requests for transfer of funds to the overseas location for meeting the liabilities of the deceased approval of rbi is required so i repeat wherever an nri has a resident nominee and on the death of the nri naturally the amounts pass on to the resident nominee but in case if the resident nominee wants to make an outward remittance towards meeting the liabilities of the deceased in the overseas location approval of rbi is required the other point which i commonly face is the power of attorney the poa holders keep in mind the power of attorney is restricted to the operations in the accounts many a times the poa holders come to the bank asking for opening another nre account they come sometimes for repatriating the funds outside by debiting the nre account they also come with a request to make payments towards gifts to a resident in india or sometimes they come with a request to transfer funds from one nre to another nre or they also have a request to invest funds of the nri in certain instruments so this is not permitted the power of attorney is restricted to the operations in the account of the nri for local expenditure now coming to fc nrb foreign currency non resident bank accounts actually here this is one of the best investments that the nri can look into when he remits surplus funds available with him because this is a foreign currency non resident bank account that means you are mitigating the exchange fluctuation risk on the foreign currency which you are bringing into the country here one thing you need to keep in mind the minimum tenor of this deposit is 1 year and maximum is 5 years so here again i have come across many of the nris wanting to close the account within 1 year period so many a times they say that they were not aware of the regulation so here the regulation is wherever an nri is investing in fcnrb deposits foreign currency non resident bank accounts it's a fixed deposit 
if the deposit doesn't run for a minimum of one year period rbi doesn't permit payment of interest on the balances so we had a very big practical case we have come across some practical cases some nris invest in fcnrb for say three years period and at the end of 11 months and 15 days they withdraw for admission requirements for admitting the child in the college or for the educational expenditure or for medical expenses in which case the nri is not eligible for interest because the deposit has not run for one year period so here many of the nris expressed that they were not aware of this regulation so keep in mind any deposit in foreign currency non resident bank account in foreign currency should be for a minimum of one year period and if the deposit is closed within one year no interest is payable and the maximum tenor for this deposit is 5 years and here because it's a foreign currency deposit the interest is linked to libor london interbank offered rate and now again coming to investments when you say which product is better before the uh, invention of covid 19 we were advocating bringing the funds into the fcnrb because libor was at between 1.80 to 2.50 but today because of the covid situation the libor has dropped to as low as 0.5%. Of course, today uh, we are not getting much investments under foreign currency during this uh, COVID crisis, but the LIBOR is definitely going to go up. The market view is that if not today or if not within this year, LIBOR is definitely going up because that is the benchmark for borrowing and lending across the globe. So the major global players will not allow LIBOR to be as low as 0.5. That too for uh, US dollars. So this is definitely going to go up. So one of the opportunities that you can encash when the LIBOR moves up. But here there was one more question from one of the participants about forward contracts. See, some of the banks have a product wherein they combine the foreign currency deposit, they load the swap cost, and they also reckon the MIBOR in the Indian rupees and they provide a product to the customer that I'll pay you around 9% if it is withdrawn in Indian rupees. And this is nothing but a triple advantage product. That is, you will get the benefit of exchange fluctuation risk. You will get the benefit of moving MIBOR, that is Mumbai Interbank Offered Rate. And you also will get the benefit of rupee payment. But here, some of the banks have these products. But my suggestion will be, wherever you are dealing with a particular bank, if they don't have this product, or even without going for that product, you can go for booking of forward contracts. Many of the NRIs are not aware that they are eligible to book forward contracts on the foreign exchange exposure they have. So when you put a deposit in the foreign currency, fix a deposit, FCNRB account, you can always book a forward contract, keeping the deposit as collateral with the branch or with the bank. And for the tenor of the deposit, a forward contract can be booked so that you can take advantage of the forward premium and you can lock in your rate. Now coming to deposits, I told about the NRE deposits, which is a rupee deposit, the FCNRB deposit, which is a foreign currency deposit. But what is the best ideal way of investing in any of these products? So I would suggest read the market and maybe you can split over 30% in NRE, rupee deposits, 70% in foreign currency, when the rupee is on the depreciating mode. So wherever the rupee is depreciating, you can always invest in foreign currency deposits so that you will take advantage of the increase in premium. And wherever you have other funds surplus, apart from investing in FCNRB, you can always in, invest in NRE deposits. So keep a combination of either 30%, 70% portfolio or a 40%, 60% portfolio, but all to be decided by you because there are banks, there are uh, bankers who advise you, but the decision should be yours so that you will reap the benefits based on your movement of your reading of the market and the movement of the rates across the globe. Now coming to the next point, RFC account. So uh, you had got a detailed explanation from uh, Mr. Oswal about returning NRIs. So again, here I come across a practical uh, scenario where NRIs do not declare to the bank for having returned to the country for permanent settlement. 
because the intention of the NRI coming back to the country is very important. As per FEMA regulations, the intention of the person going abroad or the intention of the person coming abroad, coming into the country. So wherever you feel that you have come back to the country for good, ensure that you redesignate the existing NRE account into a resident account or into the resident foreign currency account. So here, FEMA regulations provide you an option that the balances in the NRE account, the rupee balances in the NRE account can be converted into foreign currency account, either in full or based on your decision. So you can convert either the entire 100% balances in the NRE rupee account into a foreign currency, which is named as a resident foreign currency account, or you can convert a portion of it. So what is the advantage? When you convert the account into RFC account, resident foreign currency account, again, you can take the benefit of the exchange fluctuation risk. Again, observing the market tendencies, you can take a decision. So there was a query from one of the participants on the status of the FCNRB. So wherever you return back to India and the FCNRB is live, FEMA regulations permit continuation of this deposit till maturity. One of the best advantages for the RFC account is whatever income is accrued to you overseas, like for example, your pension funds, your superannuation benefits, or any other monetary benefits provided by the employer, erstwhile employer, the overseas employer, can be deposited in the RFC account. Or wherever you have assets overseas, acquired by inheritance, or by way of gift by a non-resident outside India, that also can be sold and the proceeds can be created to the RFC account. So here, this in account earns you interest. And as Mr. Oswal was telling, for the next two years, you will be a resident, but not ordinarily resident. So this is the concept of RFC account. And here again, you can have joint accounts. So there was a question again, whether I can have a joint account with a resident. See, as long as the resident is not operating the account, in other words, FEMA regulations permit only the NRI to be operating the account wherever you are the first applicant because you are getting the advantage of the interest exemption. The second applicant cannot operate the account. So during the tenor of the deposit, the operation will be by the NRI only, in which case joint account with a resident is permissible, whether it's a NRO account or a NRE account or a RFC account joint account with a resident being the second applicant is permitted but joint account with in fcnrb is not permissible as per regulatory guidelines fcnrb cannot be in joint names as long as one of the participants one of the account holder is a resident but wherever the joint account holders are nris fcnrb is permissible now there was a query on loans loans to nris or loans to third parties so today, regulatory guidelines permit loans against the security of funds held in the NRE account or the FCNRB account, either to the account holder himself or to a third party. And the loans can be both fund-based and non-fund-based, but the only requirement that you have to ensure is loans cannot be repatriated outside India. That is point number one. The other point is the loans can be for personal purposes or for carrying out any business activities in India. And keep in mind, no relending is permitted. Loans are not for carrying out agriculture and plantation activities. And the loans are not given for investment in real estate. But you can take loans for purchasing a property for your requirement. An NRI is permitted to avail loans based on the security of the funds held in the NRE or the FCNRB account for acquiring residential property for own use. And even overseas branches, see there are many banks who have branches abroad, say Canada Bank Dubai or Axis Bank Hong Kong or ICICI Bank Bahrain. So even branches of the overseas banks can provide loans to the NRIs against the security of the funds held in India. So there is no need that you should have a deposit in Dubai branch. So as far as long as you have deposits in your branch in India, the overseas branches, RBA permits overseas branches to lend to the NRIs based on the security of the funds held with branches in India. 
Now the next point which I thought I will uh, narrate here will be the outward remittances. An NRI can take the money back. Any NRI wanting to repatriate the funds from his NRO, as I told you earlier, the maximum is US dollars 1 million in a financial year, subject to taxes. And wherever an NRI wants to repatriate the funds from the NRE account or the FCNRB account or the RFC, there is no limit. Entire amount can be taken back. Of course, here there is no uh, 15 CACB required. One more thing is an NRA can also provide loans to the close relatives in India, subject to a maximum of 250,000 in a financial year. And the condition is that no interest payment is involved and the repayment of the loan should be more than one year. So as an NRI, you can loan to a close relative in India, subject to a maximum of $250,000 in a financial year or equivalent in other currencies and subject to the condition that there is no interest involved and the tenor of the loan should be more than one year. And an NRI, many of you are aware, you can invest in India either under the FDI route, repatriation basis or under non-repatriation basis. So wherever you are investing in a sole proprietorship firm or a partnership firm, it will be on non-repatriation basis. And wherever you are investing in an LLP or a company, it comes under the FDI route and you can take it back. It can be on repatriation basis. So uh, because of the time constraints, I will not be able to detail out uh, many of the regulatory guidelines because I don't want to be uh, uh, between you and the time. So uh, when it comes to investments, as I told you earlier, you need to make a decision. And as a suggestion, I can tell you that you can spread over your investments in both NRE accounts, FCNRB accounts. And we have a lot of uh, bonds being issued. Maybe during the COVID crisis, we don't have any issuances as of now. Maybe once the revival is there, there may be many of the state governments as well as the government of India bonds coming out. Of course, there may be a lock-in period there. So depending on the lock-in period and your appetite towards uh, uh, the rate of return, you can even look at those investment opportunities. But keep in mind that whatever you are investing, ensure that you spread over your investments. Of course, as a banker, we always suggest for an FCNRB deposit during the period prior to COVID because dollar was already always appreciating. And even now, our sense, the market view is that dollar will be appreciating, but we have to see to what extent it appreciates. So as a NRI or as a NRI CA, you need to watch the market and hence a decision has to be taken appropriately to invest your uh, surplus amounts in different types of uh, products. So thank you very much for the uh, opportunity that you have given to me. And I also thank the association, the Tirupur Management Association. And uh, we can take questions, of course, depending on uh, the uh, time available. So now I leave the floor open to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Somasekar, sir, for an uh, excellent presentation. We both chartered accountants as well as the management professionals and late about your speech. And many of the questions is already covered by you. Uh, so thanks a lot, sir, for uh, having sparing your valuable time with us. Thank uh, you very much. Now we'll go for the questionnaires session. Postwals uh, uh, are also having a lot of questions uh, yeah. pending with you. So, or to Oswald, sir, shall we start the questions session? Yes, yes, yes. No yeah, problem. Yeah. You can ask yeah. all like, the questions. Yeah. Like, uh, like Mr. Oswald said, even I am available any time, uh, yeah. wherever uh, the, uh, the child accountants feel that they should reach out to me. Yeah. I have the number with you. You can always share yeah. because yeah. learning is a continuous exercise and each session will be an experience by itself. Yeah. No, if there are many more questions, you can have one joint session between myself and Mr. Someshwar okay. and we can we can organize one additional session for you okay. all. Okay, okay, okay. Now so we are you... about uh, 8.50, so yes. we'll take uh, two questions quickly okay. so that we'll wind up around 9 o'clock. 
uh, along with uh, former chairman of uh, Catholic CSB Bank Limited, C. T. S. Anandraman sir is with us. He will make a ma remark and finally we will conclude. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, Oswald sir, tax planning for returning NRI, whose major income will be interest on his NRI deposits. Is there any scope for tax planning for NRI returning? Uh, NRI deposit, as uh, rightly said by our banker friend, will possibly one has to look at and convert into foreign currency deposit. But nevertheless, interest there the income will be less, but the appreciation in the value of dollar will uh, increase, provided the rupee depreciates. Then the taxability does not arise. On the appreciation, there will be no tax. But uh, Interest earned will be fully taxable because once you become resident, for the two years period, you are not ordinary resident, you are still advantages continues, but thereafter the taxation will be uh, no choice. On the contrary, India has gone for a high net worth individuals, rate, uh, the taxation rates are very high. Today, if the income is beyond 5 crores of rupees, the tax rate is 43% virtually from every 10 lakh rupees income above and above. Above 10 lakhs of rupees, whole of the income is subject to 43% tax. So that is one of the draconian. I think there is some, uh, we have been representing to the government, the government, this was an amendment made last year and uh, there is no, government is not considering that this is very bad part of the government, that what can we do? Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question. Mechanism by which a NRI can declare all his foreign assets to the income tax department, he can repatriate, it. that means he can repatriate this amount to India during ROR status without tax. You see, person who is non-resident for long period, and has uh, unfortunately, I had one time uh, opportunity to speak in Dubai Charter Accountant Society in Dubai, and I gave a lecture saying that mind well, please. India is heading for I think it was five six years before we before the black money came in. I said you please preserve all the evidences of your property acquisition, whether in India or abroad. That will be very essential because. If you do not have those details, you are heading for trouble if you are coming back to India and you are required to file the return. Indian authorities ask all the sources, information about your source of income. Before returning, in, uh, returning to India, if the deposits are lying in India for last number of years, nobody will ask you any question because these were lying for a number of years and you have been uh, abroad for a number of years. But if you have got any other assets, Please preserve all your evidences, particularly removal properties, etc. If you have got any partnerships abroad, get the accounts audited so that you are amounts. And if you are coming back, if you are a shareholder of a company, declare the dividend out of the retained earnings over there and get it credited to your account. Once it is credited to your account, thereafter you get the money anytime back, no problem. Income tax will not be leviable on that. But if you become resident and the dividend is declared by that company, you will be taxable on the dividend in India at the full rate. So that care one should take. So returning India has much to lose if he does not plan it out properly. But if he plans it out properly, if he is a shareholder of a company, company declares dividend, and the amounts in, in Dubai, you don't have a ton, uh, the, uh, uh, restrictions on payment immediately of the dividend. Dividend can be credited to your account in that country, in that company. And that money can be then shown to the tax authorities in India filing the return, getting confirmation, and then they say that this is amount receivable. And once you re there are, once you show this is receivable, thereafter you receive the amount, Indian tax authority cannot tax it. Okay, okay. Uh, next question is, uh, is the share of retained earnings or shared earnings in a foreign company on the date of residency change taxable when it is remitted to India in the future? Uh, exactly. In fact, luckily I asked you, I answered <laughs> you this question indirectly okay. earlier. Okay. If, yeah, you, yeah, if yeah. you have got a retained earning abroad, before returning, declare dividend and credit to your account. But oh. once you become resident and thereafter you declare dividend, the dividend will become taxable. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, final questions. Profit or bonus or maturity value at maturity of foreign life insurance investment 
and money earned from outside india and matured during the ror and money remitted to india is these proceeds are taxable in india section 1010d of the income tax act gives complete exemption for the life insurance of policies whether it is in india or abroad and you have received that money even after you returning back it is not liable to tax including bonus and all other amounts credited by the lic or the insurance company of the foreign country also you receive that amount it is a contractual payment provided there is a condition that the premium should be for uh, you should have paid premium for 10 years also therefore it is not taxable okay thanks sir thanks a lot sir with this uh, we uh, are concluding mr soni the... mr yeah. soni if you can give yeah. me just two minutes there are yeah, two yeah. questions Proceed, on the chat box i will just finish that uh, there is a question from uh, jay thomas is it possible okay. to convert nra deposit to fcnrb deposit fully or partially it is permissible any time okay. a depositor has the option but only thing is you have to see what is the uh, advantage you get in converting a rupee to foreign currency or a foreign currency to rupee vice versa also is permitted then okay. uh, there is a question from uh, pani on uh, fdi he says that uh, during the lockdown uh, uh, if a company were to issue right shares and if the china bound company wants more shares now maybe many of you would have seen the newspapers any investments under the fdi route from a chinese investor requires government approval so uh, government has uh, kept in abeyance the removing of the approval so this is not permitted then uh, there is a question from uh, on the lrs there is a question from pani again no sir it is permitted subject to yes. government of india's approval <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a question from pani again on the lrs see lrs is a liberalized remittance scheme for the resident individuals wherein a resident individual including a minor can invest up to 2 lakh 50000 dollars in a financial year equivalent in other currencies so here the question is he wants to invest uh, not under oa uh, wos see here wherever you are investing in the capacity of a promoter or a uh, uh, managing director or uh, in the standing of taking the entire stake it should be under the odi route of course there uh, there is no approval from rbi required the ad bank will take the odi form and file the odi form po on the rbi portal and get you the uim number so there is not much complexity but it should be under the odi route so i think that's it from my side uh, yes so you, once you obtain yeah. uh, uim number it is your obligation to report to the reserve bank of india yes. every year yes every year report. by filing the annual performance reports annual progress reports has to be filed correct thank you thank you so much sir sir adding more and also ca tipu otswal so so nice sir uh, now we are uh, moving to re remark by our past president and former chairman of csb bank limited ca ts anandaraman sir uh, unmute yourself anandaraman sir please Yes, yes, yes. Please, sir. Sir, uh, you are not audible, sir. Please unmute. Unmute. Yes. No. No. Sound is not coming, sir. no not audible sir something with the sound system sir no sound is not coming sir no sound yeah please please yes sound is sir no, not audible some something with the sound system uh i think uh, anandraman sir uh, we'll hold uh, one minute uh, try to resolve the sound system uh, no no not audible sir i think some 
sound your microphone may be unmute uh let the andaman sir uh, resolve that issue meantime we have former chairman of dubai chapter james matthew is with us sir do you have some questions or uh, yeah andaman sir sir sound is we are not audible sir ask him can he connect on the phone on the same uh, and then speak through the phone rather than sir, his computer uh, connect through phone sir at least instead of computer you connect the phone sound not coming sir CS Sony this is James yeah. Matthew yeah yes this is okay James Matthew meanwhile and Ram sir please uh, make sure the sound is coming uh, i think some microphone mm -hmm. might have been muted in your system first of all thank you sony for uh, a great session um uh, tp as well sir and uh, uh, i had the opportunity to host you around 6 7 years back while i was the chairman of uh, dubai chapter oh <laughs> and uh, when our uh, gr was the uh, president at that time so uh, very very happy to see you of course you know you have always been so your insightful presentations always so we are extremely happy to have you here and uh, covid given the covid situations uh, we are now speaking in this way thank you for the opportunity i think there have been a number of questions which have been raised i'm sure that we will have to go for a session separately on it okay. because um, you know we we estimate a good number of people to get back to india india will will india will be an opportunity for many of us uh, because uh, the situations are in that great here uh, so uh, you, it is estimated that half a million people are expected to leave uae uh, because that is around maybe around 75 80% are you know blue collar workers maybe still there will be another 15% people will get back white collar workers white collar um, employment people will be getting back to india so uh, i mean it's a, it's a timely discussion so thank you so much and uh, of course um, mr somshekar and uh, uh, of course yeah, gr has gone i suppose yeah so yeah. thank you so much i don't have any questions and happy to see you all of you thank you thank you, sir. thank you thank you thank you so thank you thank you thank uh, you and travel sir please no 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 voice so no, this voice is not coming sir so sir you uh, stop the video and start speaking sometime that will resolve the issue no sound sir voice is not andram sir you are not audible andram sir okay uh, so we will uh, skip the remark uh, andram sir is uh, speaking from his side but we are not able to hear him uh, i think some uh, issue with his connectivity uh, uh, honorary secretary sijo anything to add else we'll move or to the vote of thanks by Darmajan Patteri, Sijo. Nothing to add from my side, but uh, as everybody said, excellent presentation. I think a lot of question in in the chat box. You can see a lot of people answering yeah. and appreciating the whole event. And time has been a constraint over here. I yeah. do understand, and as requested by the other members from NRIs and others, I think Sony, if you can coordinate one more section for them. you will be doing a great service from our part i think yeah. that is one thing which should be happening as of now yeah, yeah. nothing more from my side i think yeah, yeah. vote of thanks will be most well appreciated thank you thank you thank you yeah th thank you zico uh, most of our ca as well as management and professionals benefited out of this program
Uh, now moving to the vote of thanks uh, by Darbaja Bhattari, is, uh, Director of Ex Auditing Dubai. His expertise in auditing, accounting, and taxation, FO, especially in that area. He is a past chairman of uh, Dubai uh, Charter Students Association and former trustee of ICA Dubai chapter, the large office chapter of ICA. He is also co-founder of Investor Investment Club, which helps a small and medium-sized investors to build wealth by investing in the share markets. Uh, actually, this program we can make success just because of the effort by the Dharmajan to coordinate in Middle East along with the Ajax uh, or to Dharmajan for the vote of thanks. And then sir. Voice is not coming, sir. We are uh, really missed. Uh, many of our members would like to hear from you because you are the investment consultant and uh, uh, CA who passed at the age of 19 and worked a lot uh, in United Nations as well as your book is using in the Botswana University. I know that, sir. Uh, really a busy for all of us. Darbajan, uh, over to you, Darbajan, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for everyone here because you made it possible. We are late, still we are hooked to this session. That reveals the quality of the content we shared. Time will be always short to share the expertise and experience of our learned speaker. But good thing is that we will get a, another chance and many, many chance to interact again. I would like to thank on behalf of everyone present here, CAG Ramaswamy sir, CATP Oswal sir, Mr. Somat Shekhar sir, and unfortunately we could not heard uh, T.S. Anandraman sir, but uh, his efforts, we will hear him from him soon. I do not want to make it very long, but before we leave this session, I have shared the feedback link in the chat. That is our rule number two, and our rule number three was not to forget the first rule. You were an awesome audience. There was no disturbance, muting all the time. Thank you so much. The collaboration will go on. We will find more opportunity to work together and more opportunity to NRIs and residents in this together to make India's dreams uh, happen and our dreams to be a reality. Thank you, everyone. And I want to thank one team, team TMA, who made this possible. Thank you, Sony, for leading uh, this session. And we know that your team is the one what makes the difference. So we will, uh, we are looking forward to have more sessions and I will be glad to help in all the way. Not only me, the 500 chapter attendants from uh, uh, Kerala and others who joined here. Thank you for the uh, transferring the cultural capital of uh, Kerala to the professional capital of Kerala. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay Thank safe. You. See you soon. See Thank you. you. Thank you. So with this, we come to our end of our webinar session. Uh, I say thank you to all for spending your precious time with the Trishur Management Association for such a long time. Uh, thanks. Thanks again. With this, we come to end of our webinar. Thank you.